In today's video lecture, we move definitively beyond Descartes to talk about the empiricist John Locke's conception of perception and ideas. Though Locke doesn't talk specifically about the imagination in the sections we're looking at, we'll see that his conception of sensory perception is fully ideas-based, meaning that, though Locke is an empiricist about perception, he nonetheless thinks that what we engage with when it comes to sensory experience of objects is not raw sense data, but rather mental images, ideas in us, that are caused by our senses coming in contact with objects. So in the last video, we talked about Hobbes's empiricist view of imagination that directly contradicted much of Descartes' duplicative theory of corporeal imagination on the one hand and intellectual ideas on the other. There are a few leftover ideas from Hobbes that I think can help us in advance of reading Locke. Locke himself doesn't discuss the imagination specifically. What Locke emphasizes is ideas, and we'll see that these are absolutely central to his understanding of perception. Hobbes, though, makes an explicit connection between sensory perception and imagination in a way that I think well explains the empiricist conception of what role the imagination plays in generating ideas in the first place. For Hobbes, the imagination is the faculty of the mind that is responsible for generating thoughts. What imagination does is it converts raw sense data into information that our understanding can make use of. How? The imagination is the faculty that essentially holds on to sense data for later use. The imagination retains mental images that are derived from sensation. Hobbes writes, Imagination, therefore, is nothing but decaying sense, and is found in men and many other living creatures, as well sleeping and waking. In other words, Without the imagination, we wouldn't have a way to hold on to the information from sensation, which is immediately taken in. That sensation is immediately taken in. He calls the imagination decaying sense because he envisions it as a kind of impression retainer that fades with time. We'll see this kind of thinking again in Hume. But for Hobbes, because imagination plays this image retention role, it means that imagination is part of memory as well as the understanding. Essentially, the imagination is here being conceived of as an idea's repository, or idea's faculty, that both language and reason draw upon. This is why I think Hobbes makes for a good segue to Locke. Locke doesn't make this point explicit. He talks about ideas and their role in everything from sensory perception to memory and retention to, to language and reason. Hobbes, though, identifies the imagination explicitly as the mental faculty responsible for ideas. Here's how Hobbes explains the connection between experience, memory, and imagination. He writes, Much memory or memory of many things is called experience. Again, imagination being only of those things which have been formerly perceived by sense, either all at once or by parts at several times. Experience is what provides the foundation for the materials of the imagination, which can then be either reproduced in the mind, as it was originally sensed, or which the imagination can use as the material for inventing new composite images that we haven't directly experienced. Hobbes explains it this way. The former, which is the imagining the whole object as, we, as it was presented to sense is simple imagination, as when one imagineth a man or horse which he hath seen before. The other is compounded, and when from the sight of a man at one time and a horse at another, we conceive in our mind a centaur. Both Hobbes and Locke are empiricists because they both think that experience necessarily comes first before our thinking. Everything has to start with a sensory experience, even if what gets taken up afterwards is ideas-based. Without an initial experience, there is nothing to think about. Descartes, on the other hand, is a rationalist. He prioritized reason over sensation and argued that reason comes first 
At least it comes first when we're talking about what constitutes genuine knowledge. As a quick review, Descartes argued that the most solid information we have comes not from experience, but from reason. In other words, from our own extra experiential thought processes. Reason on this view is then prior to experience. It's a priori. And since reason is an innate mental capacity, meaning it effectively comes with our basic operating system, if you will, it means that these more solid ideas are innate in us. And therefore, our ideas about reality are also innate on Descartes' view. Last time we talked about how Descartes sees effectively two streams of ideas about objects that run side by side. One has its source in sensation, like the mental image of what a triangle looks like, and another comes from mathematical reasoning about the definition of what a triangle is. Now, you may have been thinking that the mathematical definition of a triangle, or the knowledge that bodies have extension, has to come from having seen these things first. Surely, we have to have seen, have, have had some sensory experience of triangles or physical bodies in the first place before we can start asking what is mathematically or necessarily true about them. Hobbes absolutely agrees, and so does Locke, as we'll see in a second. On the empiricist view, you perhaps do have reason-based knowledge about objects that enhances your understanding. But these ideas are not innate. They come from experience. That means that the idea of a triangle, both the mental picture of it and the mathematical definition of it, both originally come from sensory experience. Reason then takes up the sensory image and thinks about it. Locke agrees with this. Book one of an essay concerning human understanding argues that we are born as tabula rasa. We have, sorry, no ideas, says Locke, are innate. I didn't assign for you to read book one because he reiterates the important parts, important for us, that is, in book two. He starts that book off by restating that no ideas are innate. On Locke's account, he thinks that not even the most basic principles of reason are known innate, or innately. Not even that something can't be and not be at the same time. He points out that children don't know this until they're taught it. Everything we know has to come from some kind of exposure to it. He writes, I know it is received doctrine that men have native ideas and original characters stamped upon their minds in their first being. Let us then suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters, without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? To this I answer in one word, from experience, in that all our knowledge is founded, and from that it ultimately derives itself. Before we get to Locke's view of ideas, I need to clarify something I mentioned last time to avoid confusion. I said in the last lecture that only Descartes, among the philosophers that we're looking at, that is, believes that we have two ideas running simultaneously in conceiving of objects. But to avoid confusion, I need to clarify that the issue is that Descartes sees the ideas of experience and the ideas of reason as running separately but simultaneously. That's the difference. This is important to make clear because you'll see that Locke also, has, also is often talking about two kinds of ideas. But he means something very different than Descartes does. For Locke, we do have two kinds of ideas, ones of sensation and ones of reflection. But the difference here is the object in question. So these are not two sets of ideas running simultaneously about objects. These are rather two kinds of ideas that have different objects of focus and a different source of information. 
Ideas of sensation are derived from sensory experience of external objects. Ideas of reflection are also derived from experience, but experience of inner objects, meaning of the things happening inside of you. So ideas of sensation tell us about external objects. This is information that originally derives from our bodily senses. Seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. Ideas of sensation are how we know what objects look like, what, ob what sounds sound like, that there's a world outside of us that we can engage with and talk about. Ideas of reflection include things like perception, thinking, doubting, believing, reasoning, knowing, willing, and, quote, all the different actings of our mind that we observe within us. This list should sound familiar. These are the functions that Descartes said must be inherent to him as a thinking thing. Here's how Locke describes the ideas of sensation as opposed to the ideas of reflection. He says, first, our senses, conversant about particular sensible objects, do convey into the mind several distinct perceptions of things, according to those various ways wherein those objects do affect them. And thus we come by those ideas we have of yellow, white, heat, cold, soft, hard, bitter, sweet, and all those which we call sensible qualities. This great source of most of the ideas we have, depending wholly on our senses and derived by them to the understanding, I call sensation. By reflection, then, in the following part of this discourse, I will be understood to mean that notice which the mind takes of its own operations and the manner of them, by reason whereof there come to be ideas of these operations in the understanding. These two great sources of ideas, Locke thinks, is exhaustive. All our ideas come from one of these two sources, or some combination of both. He writes, These two, I say, viz. external material things as the objects of sensation, and the operations of our minds within as the objects of reflection, are to me the only originals from whence all our ideas take their beginnings. In other words, these two kinds of ideas, those of sensation and those of reflection, are the only two sources where all our ideas come from. Unlike Descartes, Locke does not privilege ideas derived from within as being more solid than those of sensation. Rather, he puts these two on par, both being derived from experience. He takes Descartes on directly on this point, using Descartes' own language to drive, to drive his point home. He writes, For though he that contemplates the operations of his mind cannot but have plain and clear ideas of them, yet unless he turns his thoughts that way and considers them attentively, he will no more have clear and distinct ideas of all the operations of his mind and all that may be observed therein than he will have of the particular ideas of any landscape or of the parts and motions of a clock. In other words, Locke is suggesting that ideas of sensation are just as capable of being clear and distinct as those of inner thought. So Locke doesn't privilege internal experience the way that Descartes does. External experience that comes from sensation has just as much access to solidity and truth as internal experience does. He argues that internal experiences are just as susceptible to error as external senses. This doesn't mean that we have no clear and distinct perceptions. It just means that he thinks Descartes is wrong to say that those inner experiences have this privileged status as being fully knowable to us. But note, this doesn't mean that Locke thinks that sensation is infallible. Not at all. Locke, as I'll emphasize in a moment, is absolutely not a direct realist about sensory experience. Locke is more properly understood as being an indirect realist about perception, 
He thinks that all our knowledge comes from the, wor the world of experience, but that our experiences are necessarily me mediated by our mind, and our mind receives and thinks about those experiences. Let me explain. On Locke's account, we are only indirectly in contact with the objects of the external world. Why? Because just by the nature of what a mind is, it means that it can only contemplate or experience ideas. Ideas are the only content of a mind. In thinking about objects or experiences, we're necessarily engaging with ideas because we're engaging with something in our minds. This still means that the senses give us access to the world of objects. But it's just that the raw sense data has to necessarily get translated somehow into ideas in us in order for us to experience that data as a sensation. So there's an important difference between the texture of rough sandpaper that is being picked up by your fingertips and the experience you have of roughness. Your fingers don't have ideas. They have raw sensory experience. But in order for that sensory experience to be registered in you as a perception of sandpaper, your mind needs an idea that's generated as a result of that tactile feeling of roughness. You'll notice that Locke will always talk about sensation as ideas. The sensation of roughness on the fingertips without the idea of roughness in the mind is not a perception or a true sensory experience at all. The experience is only an experience if it is registered in the mind, and the mind only registers ideas. So this means that the things we see once taken up in the mind as an experience, are effectively converted to a mental image, an idea. And so what we are engaging with is not exactly the object when we think about this red shiny apple. What we are engaging with is the idea of a red shiny apple that is created in us as a result of coming in sensory contact with the apple. Now Locke thinks that some of these uh, sensory ideas, um, or sensory derived ideas, are more closely connected to objects than others. He makes a distinction between what he calls simple ideas and what he calls complex ideas. We'll follow Locke's lead by focusing on simple ideas first. These are essentially the basic sensory building blocks that allow us to formulate com complex mental pictures of objects. Simple ideas are single sensory data points, effectively. These are the isolated sensory components that we experience in many different objects. For example, the color red, roughness, softness, the key of A minor, sweetness. These are all simple ideas that we get from sensation and recognize again and again in a variety of contexts. We've seen this kind of thinking already in Descartes. In the first meditation, Descartes entertained an idea that effectively is the one that Locke gives us here. The proposal is that basic sensory ideas like color, shape, smell, taste, can only come from direct sensory experience with objects. Descartes called these simple universals. As I hinted at when we, when we looked at the first meditation, Descartes is hard to follow on what he is proposing about these simple universals. Sometimes he suggests that you can only have a conception of the color blue if you've seen the color blue at some point. He says this not only in the first meditation, but also in the sixth. But at other times, he's trying to emphasize that our true knowledge of them come from, come from reason. But he doesn't quite explain to us why we shouldn't think that these basic ideas are a credible argument for saying that sense perception and imagination are the true original source for our knowledge of these fundamental, simple universals. Locke, though, will make precisely this case. 
He identifies these simple qualities of objects as being so basic and so fundamental that they have to come from outside of us. Not only that, but they make up our most basic ideas about what the world, both inside and outside of us, is like. Locke argues that these simple ideas are taken up in the mind passively, a point that Descartes also notices. Locke writes, As the bodies that surround us do diversely affect our organs, the mind is forced to receive the impressions and cannot avoid the perception of those ideas that are annexed to them. Just because they're passive, though, doesn't mean that they are not ideas. Simple ideas like the color blue, the taste of sweetness, or the sound of a rock hitting the ground are registered at what we might call a subconscious level of our understanding. He explains it like this. In the reception of simple ideas, the understanding is, for the most part, passive. These simple ideas, when offered to the mind, the understanding can no more refuse to have, nor alter, when they are imprinted, nor blot them out, and make new ones in itself, than a mirror can refuse, alter, or obliterate the images or ideas which the objects set before it do therein produce. This means, just as Descartes suggested in the first meditation, without really taking it up again, that these basic simple ideas cannot be invented by us. Locke thinks that the mind can't refuse these kinds of basic impressions. They come to us from the world at an involuntary level. One proof for this is that you can't create mental images of these kinds of basic, basic sensory ideas without a sensory faculty designed to register it or them. Locke writes, Yet I think it is not possible for anyone to imagine any other qualities in bodies, howsoever constituted, whereby they can be taken notice of besides sounds, tastes, smells, visible and tangible qualities. This means that someone incapable of seeing a particular color will not have an idea of that color. For example, I'm not really sure what the color infrared or ultraviolet actually looks like. I can't even, I can't even really imagine it, other than to assume that it's a kind of red or a kind of violet, which just means that I'm using my imagination to draw on colors that I have seen. But if you, for example, told me that there's a color outside of these that's not a shade of any of the visible colors of the rainbow, or anything like any of these colors, I don't think I could even begin to fathom what you mean. Every color I can fathom is some shade of a color I have experienced. Locke, th Locke thinks that this is proof that our five senses are the necessary building blocks for any mental image we can formulate, at least of external objects. He writes, And had mankind been made with but four senses, the qualities then which are the object of the fifth sense had been as far from our notice, imagination, and conception as now belonging to a sixth, seventh, or eighth sense can possibly be. What distinguishes simple ideas from complex ones is that simple ideas are specific to one single sense organ that is designed specifically for that particular sensory input. So for example, light and color are simple ideas that are taken in by the eyes, noises and sounds of the ears, tastes and smells of the tongue and nose, etc. There are also simple ideas of reflection. These essentially align with Descartes' basic components of what he says he knows that he, as a thinking thing, can do. Things like willing, doubting, judging, reasoning, having sensory perception and imagination. For Locke, these are derived from a kind of inner sense. These basic components of what the mind can do have the status of simple ideas, and so he gives them equal footing with our basic ideas of things like color, taste, and so on, as being fundamental building blocks 
for our more complex ideas. For Locke, these simple ideas, both the sensory and reflective kind, have the status of Descartes' clear and distinct perception. Locke writes, The coldness and hardness which a man feels in a piece of ice, being as distinct ideas in the mind, as the smell and whiteness of a lily, or as the taste of sugar and the smell of a rose. And there is nothing can be plainer to a man than the clear and distinct perception he has of those simple ideas. Notice then that for Locke, clear and distinct perception is not the purview of reason, logic, and propositions. The senses on Locke's account seem to be enough to give us at least this very basic kind of clarity and distinctness about the nature of reality. Our more conscious experience of objects is not a simple idea, but a complex one. This is because complex ideas are a combination of multiple simple ideas. So when we look at an apple, we're not just receiving a simple idea of red or shiny or round. We're combining all these simple ideas together to give us a more complex picture of what an apple is with regards to these simple ideas. We do this by mentally combining simple ideas that the mind stores as impressions. This allows us to have a complex idea of the red, shiny, round apple, while also being able to recognize that each of those simple qualities can reappear in different combinations in different objects. So, for example, the coldness of ice is a simple idea. But when you have a more complete image of ice as having a range of sensory components, that it's solid, cold, translucent, cubed, that idea is complex. So at this stage, we know that Locke thinks that ideas have two originating sources. They come either from sensation or reflection. And they are either simple or complex. But notice, these are always explained in terms of ideas. I mentioned this earlier, but now I want to draw our attention to this point more closely, because this is where we get into Locke's representationalist view of perception. Our perception of the objects of, sens of sensation, and also reflection, are always mediated by ideas. Locke writes, Whatsoever the mind perceives in itself, or is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding, that I call idea. And the power to produce any idea in our mind, I call quality, of the subject wherein that power is. As I mentioned earlier, Locke doesn't think that the mind takes up raw sense data directly. Perception is always going to be mediated by our ideas of objects. What the mind takes up is ideas, but there are significant implications of this view. Because Locke thinks that the mind is engaging with ideas that effectively mediate between our direct sensory access to the world and our thoughts, it means that he's a clear representationalist meaning that on Locke's account, what we are thinking about when we think about the objects of sensation are mental representations of objects. Remember this slide from the first lecture? This is how we can understand Locke's picture of perception. It's the idea, the mental representation of the table that allows us to formulate the thought that the table is round and made of wood. Remember how Descartes said that our experience of pain and heat as a result of sticking our hand in the fire does not necessarily tell us about what the fire itself is? Locke very forcefully makes the same case. The sensations of pain and heat, Locke insists, are in us and not in the objects themselves. This seems pretty obvious when it comes to something like pain, 
You wouldn't say that pain is a quality of fire. Pain is our own sensory response to the fire. But Locke argues that this also applies to heat. Heat is not in the fire. Heat is the sensory response that we, the perceiver, have to the fire. The heat is in us, in that sense. In making this point, Locke makes a distinction between the qualities of objects and the ideas of the perceiver. The qualities of objects aren't properly speaking in the objects. They are more properly understood as the power that the object's properties have to affect our senses in ways that generate ideas in us. What do I mean by that? I mean that Locke thinks that our sensory response to objects does not give us a perfect picture of what the object actually is in itself. Our sensory response and the ideas that those responses furnish in us are not necessarily the same as what the object itself is outside of our experience of it. Locke agrees with Descartes on this. We make a mistake if we think that our mental ideas of objects look, smell, taste, and so on like what the object outside of us really is like. Locke says this, To discover the nature of our ideas the better, and to discourse of them intelligibly, it will be convenient to distinguish them as they are ideas or perceptions in our minds, and as they are modifications of the matter in bodies that cause such perceptions in us. So that we may not think, as perhaps usually is done, that they are exactly the images and resemblances of something inherent in the subject. Most of those sensations being in the mind no more the likeness of something existing without us than the names that stand for them are the likeness of our ideas, which yet upon hearing they are apt to excite in us. What does this mean? As I said earlier, the objects of sensation have qualities that produce certain ideas in us. But those qualities are not technically in the object. Technically, they're in us, in the way that our mind conceptualizes the object that we're sensing. Locke loves to divide things into categories, especially two categories. Again, I want to reiterate that this is very different from Descartes' conception of corporeal imagination and intellectual ideas. Locke can be more properly understood as creating a series of layers about our ideas, with some more primary or simple, and others secondary and complex. So just as he did when he divided our ideas into simple and complex, Locke divides the qualities in objects into primary and secondary. Let's look at the primary qualities first. The primary qualities are solidity, extension, motion, rest, and number, or quantity. Notice that these are the same basic properties of objects that Descartes thought that we could derive from reason. Locke doesn't think that these come from reason, though. These are still qualities of sensation. They are in us as ideas drawn from our experience of objects. We still have to have some kind of experience of objects to know that they have extension, solidity, and number, and that they are either moving or at rest. But what makes these primary qualities special for Locke is that, just like Descartes argued, they are logically necessary aspects of physical objects. Though these ideas are not innate in us, we can say in a certain sense that they are innate in the object, because they're part of the essential nature of what an object is. These basic structural aspects of the object, the primary qualities of bulk and shape and so on, host secondary qualities. Things like color, taste, texture, smell. 
Locke writes of these secondary qualities that such qualities, which in truth are nothing in the objects themselves, but powers to produce various sensations in us by their primary qualities, i.e. by the bulk, figure, texture, and motion of their insensible parts. So this is important to recognize. Locke thinks that both the primary and the secondary qualities are our, are our ideas in our minds that are produced by the object's effect on our senses. It's just that the ideas we have of primary qualities are more likely to resemble the objects themselves than the secondary qualities are. Locke puts it like this. From whence I think it is easy to draw this observation, that the ideas of primary qualities of bodies are resemblances of them, and their patterns do really exist in the bodies themselves. But the ideas produced in us by these have no resemblance of them at all. There is nothing like our ideas existing in the bodies themselves. They are in the bodies we denominate from them only a power to produce those sensations in us. And what is sweet, blue, or warm in idea is but certain bulk, figure, and motion of the insensible parts of the bodies themselves, which we so call, or call so. So the object has certain powers that emanate from those primary qualities that our senses pick up on and register as color, warmth, or coolness, taste, sound, etc. We don't actually experience things like extension without color or shape without some kind of surface. This is why he says that our ideas of the objects do not resemble the objects, even if the primary qualities do resemble them. Let me explain it this way. I only know of my desk as being brown and lacquer and smooth, etc. Behind these secondary qualities is a kind of substance that is extended and of a certain shape and size. But my direct experience of those primary qualities is mediated by these less reliable secondary qualities that are in my mind as a result of how my senses register them. So this may sound strange, but it isn't super far off what modern science thinks. Locke is actually drawing here on the scientific theory of his compatriot, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. The theory is called the corpuscular thesis, and it proposes that microscopic particles or molecules, in using today's terms, are what actually constitute what our eyes take in as color, and our nose takes in as odor, or our tongue takes in as flavor. So the idea is that there is effectively, again to use today's terminology, a basic molecular structure to objects that underlies all those sensory qualities that our senses pick up on. So if you take leaves as an example, we know that the color green isn't precisely in the leaf, right? What our eyes register as the color green is the way that light reflects off the molecular structure of the leaf. There is an actual tree there, or at least a collection of particles held together in a biological structure with leaves and so on. But the thing, things about the tree, like its smell, its color, it, the roughness of the bark, or the stickiness of the leaf, is more properly speaking the way that we experience the invisible to us particular molecular structure of the object. This is effectively the conception that Locke is giving us with his primary versus secondary qualities. So in Locke's terms, the molecular structure, or what have you, is what constitutes the leaf's shape and size, its primary qualities. And the color green is not actually in the object itself. It's a feature of its molecular structure that our eyes pick up on when the light hits it that we register as green. Technically, you can say that green is actually the only color not in the leaf. All the other colors of the white light are being absorbed 
and the green spectrum light is reflecting off, and that's what we see. But that secondary quality of the color is what alerts us to the shape of the leaf, its extension, its quantity, etc. But what we, what we register is the secondary qualities that, properly speaking, are not in the object at all. They're in us. Here's how Locke puts it. What I have said concerning colors and smells may be understood also of tastes and sounds, and other the like sensible qualities, which, whatever reality we, we by mistake, attribute to them, are in truth nothing in the objects themselves, but powers to produce various sensations in us, and depend on those primary qualities, viz. bulk, figure, texture, and motion of parts, as I have said. If we were sitting in lecture right now, I would show you uh, at least one YouTube video from a PBS show that I, uh, that I quite like called It's Okay to Be Smart. He has a few videos about color, a super interesting one about how few biological species actually have, the, uh, have blue pigment. Bluebirds and butterflies are not actually blue at all. It's an optical illusion caused by the shape of the hairs and feathers that bend light in a way that looks blue. There's another video about eye color and another about the color of the moon, but for copyright reasons, I'm not going to risk including those, and instead I'm just going to put the, the link in the description for you to check out if you're curious. Uh, I will, though, provide this next video clip, hoping it makes it through, just to show you that representationalism isn't just a relic of the past. The video is a modern neuroscientist talking, about, talking a lot like Locke. How do we know that we experience the real world? In fact, we probably don't. Everything that we perceive, everything that we experience is a result of the brain interpreting the sensory information that comes in in a particular way. I'm Anil Seth, I'm a professor of neuroscience at the University of Sussex in the UK. Now, you could say that all of our experiences are all hallucinated. It's just that whenever we agree about what's out there, that's what we call reality. The brain brings to bear its prior expectations about what's out there in order to interpret this mass of noisy and ambiguous sensory information that it continually encounters. Perception, instead of just being a reflection of what's actually there in the world, is always this active process of interpretation. It's easy to assume that we see with our eyes. In fact, we see with our brains. Our eyes are, of course, necessary, but what we actually end up perceiving is much more a product of how our brain interprets all this information from the eyes than the eyes being this window into a, an objective external reality. And when the balance is disturbed between how the brain interprets sensory information and what the sensory information actually is, well that's when people start to see things that other people don't. And that's what we call hallucination. So that view, explained to us there by Anil Seth, is fundamentally representationalist. The view says that we see with our brains and not with our senses, properly speaking. And it is in line with, and it's in line with Locke's thinking. Locke is making the case that there is effectively a gap between what we experience of the world and what the world actually is. We do experience the world via sensation. But what we have to accept is that what we take in through our senses is not really the real world as it is in itself. What we take in is our way of accessing the world through our own brains. Perception is something that happens in us, in our brains. We don't just blindly take in raw sens sensation from the world as a perfect replica of the world as it really is. We experience the world through our ideas, through the mental images generated in us as a result of our sensations, uh, of, of how our sensations are designed to register specific sensory data. Here's how Locke puts it. Perception is only when the mind perce re receives an impression. 
this is certain that whatever alterations are made in the body if they reach not the mind whatever impressions are made on the outward parts if they are not taken notice of within there is not perception here Locke is making the point that raw sensory data that hits the senses don't necessarily get registered in the mind as ideas. Perhaps we're distracted or not paying attention. Maybe we're asleep and didn't register the sound or the light that came on in the room. For Locke, this is not perception. Perception is only when you take notice and formulate an idea. So here he specifies this, that perception is an activity of the understanding. No idea means no perception. He writes, so that wherever there is sense or perception, there some idea is actually produced and present in the understanding. This not only clarifies to us what he means by perception, it also helps make his case. If it were true that sensation was just direct, brute, raw feels, so to speak, then we couldn't make this distinction. The body would send the signal of the sound or the light, and we'd necessarily be aware of it via the body's sensory organs alone. But this isn't how it works. Yes, we passively take in colors and sounds and so on, but even when they come in passively, they have to traverse through the mind. You have to have a mental registering of the sensation in order to notice it in a way that we could call perception. The fact that paying attention is needed to register the sensory input then suggests that ideas about sensations and not just raw sensation itself is how we access the world. If this weren't the case, then paying attention wouldn't be necessary as long as your sensory organs were working right, you'd be taking in the data. So this just re-emphasizes the point. Sensation is mediated by thought in order to be perception. It means that our experience of sensation is like this. The sensory data enters via the senses, but it gets taken up as an idea. We get the idea of the object and deal with that mental image. But there is still the problem that we can get things wrong. This is the same issue Descartes was grappling with. If our senses are giving us an incorrect mental image, how would we know that? On Locke's account, corpuscles emanating from objects generate our mental images. But there remains the question of what, if anything, about our mental image is at all like the objects. We'll see in the next week that uh, when we get to Berkeley that it isn't clear that Locke has given us a good reason to think that even the primary qualities resemble the objects themselves. Now for Locke, this problem isn't so deep that it means that we know nothing of the external world. This is, why we, this is why we call Locke an indirect realist. He holds that we do more or less have access to the real world. It's just indirect. It comes to us in a mediated way via our ideas. Sure, we may get the color or the smell off, but we can know that there are physical objects in the world that have fundamental properties that are really there. In the next lecture, I'll be concentrating on the Tamita article about Locke's representationalism. There we'll get a modern-day perspective on the problem inherent in a, in a view like Locke's. Tamita defends Locke against challengers and aims to clarify Locke's corpuscular thesis. But we'll hear from a number of 20th century philosophers who have a real problem with Locke's ideas. The worry that we'll talk about next time is whether Locke's view of ideas is too strong. So strong, in fact, that the worry is that they don't so much clarify sensory perception to the mind as they get in the way, like a curtain or a veil that sits between the mind and the objects of the world. And after that, we'll look at how Locke's immediate early modern successors, 
like Barclay, we'll touch on Reed just a tiny bit, reacted to his arguments. So I think that's enough for today's lecture. Today focused exclusively on Locke's own words. Next time we'll read uh, about Locke's thesis um, and you're going to have your reading quiz due on Monday the 18th and it'll be on the Tamita article. Thanks everybody for listening. See you next time.